welcome everyone to simply learn and for choosing us and showing us trust and faith in 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 choosing a supportive course let me have give you the introduction first about myself let me introduce about myself and after that you know i will uh, open up because everyone is on mute so i would like you to give your introduction one by one so that we all people are aware of what about our background and everything okay so you know my name is ajit pal singh rawat okay so i am your trainer for tisa as far as my educational means qualification as concerned means i am even tisa trainer means i take certification courses of, of certified information system auditor and certified information system manager okay so as far as my training sessions are concerned i have taken around 50 plus training sessions on tisa and tisa So I have given training to across 500 plus participants from multiple corporates with average of 97 percent access level. So this is my information security background. But along with that, you know, I, I, I am from network security also. I have experience and conducted many trainings on network security also. As you can see, that I am CTSP, that is a Cisco certified security professional. Okay, so I have conducted many network and security related courses. Still, I am doing that. So these are my certifications. Uh, I am an engineering graduate holding management full time management degree in HR and IT. My total experience is around 12 plus. Right now, I am heading the SOC. You know, SOC stands for Security Operation Center. Okay, so we are providing managed security services. So this is a part of managed security services. So we are providing security services to multinational car to many multinationals across which are spread worldwide. Okay, so I am holding a team. Is I am leading a team as practice basically of SOC. So I have I am a facilitator and corporate trainer with about 12 years of experience. Okay, so I do the content development. Means I have developed the content for CISA, CISM, CTSP, and all, and conducted many workshops related to information security and network security. So this is the brief introduction of myself. Okay, so this is about the Simply Learn. So you know about the website of Simply Learn. We have many courses available. So when we started in 2010, so now you can see. Our journey so far, so we have the centers and students spread across the world. So we are providing many services, many training courses like ETL, project management, okay, HP, MSP, Microsoft related courses. There's so many courses we have. So you can see the list of our courses by visiting our website. Okay, so you can see the list, the domains in which Simply Learn is providing you the services like training, the project management, digital marketing. Big data, HIL, and all. Okay, so you can see 25 persons at 25 certification, 120 plus instructors, lead batches, 90 days. So along with that, you know, all the courses are online basis. Okay, so so we have a so you know when you join the simply learn, you will be given access to the e-learning component. So e-learning component you can easily access by visiting lms. simply learn. com. Okay, in that you will have to log in with a username and password. And uh, when you log in using the username and password, okay, so you will be seeing the My Course tab. Under this, you can see the list of courses for which you have enrolled. So click on the My Course tab to review the list of courses for which you have enrolled. Show the course that you want to begin. And you know, along with that, I would suggest because you all are have enrolled for you all have enrolled for Caesar course. So in Caesar course, when you go for it, when you visit the elements dot simply learn dot com, you will be seeing the simulation test solved. So I would suggest you to use this simulation test because these are very very good. I myself have reviewed that question answers and simulation test that will really help you in passing the examination. Okay, if you have any problem, if you come across from any issue, so that can you can raise your ticket to help and support for all your query. Okay. So let's start with everyone. Let's start with Banka. He's the first one. So Banka, I'm unmuted. You can you please introduce yourself? Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Violin Banka. I'm from um, United States, specifically Washington D.C. Um, I'm currently um, attending a community college that is Prince George Community College, and. Basically, that's me. I really want to uh, come into this program to do it. Uh, we have uh, a mindset to study. This is a uh, uh, course of, yeah, 
That's me. Um, I don't have any experience in the uh, IT, IT specifically. I had a, a degree from financial accounting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I really want to do um, uh, IT, specifically the audit part of it. So that's why I choose to come in. Yes. Thanks, Ponga. Thanks for introducing, introducing to us, Doctor. Okay. Next is uh, Juju. Are you able to hear me, sir? I think he has joined. Not showing any mic connection. The next one is Gopi Krishna. Gopi, please introduce yourself. Gopi Krishna. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I am Gopi Krishna. I am from Toronto. Okay. I am a certified ISO. ISO Brosman. Okay. Navigant Technology, IT Security Manager, IT Security Brosman. Okay. I have two years, of, two years of experience in IT Security. Okay. So I'm okay. Uh, Pupi, when are you planning to take the examination? Is it June or have you have you enrolled yourself for the June examination or September one you are planning to take? No, I'm planning for the September examination. Okay, fine. So do you have previous experience in IT audit? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I'm working in an, in an audit firm. So my company got the ISO 2001 certification. Okay. So I was a part of the ISO implementation team in our company. Okay. So apart from that, I am, I am a postgraduate in computer Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your introduction, dear. Okay, next one is Hamad. Hamad, can you introduce yourself here to the class? Hi, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, dear. Yeah. Hi, everyone. How are you? I hope, I, I hope you are doing good. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hamad, Hamad Muhammad, uh, uh, KSA. Uh, I am Sudanese. Uh, okay. I am a certified accountant. I have a civil in audit, but in financial operation and other things. I don't have any experience in uh, IS audit. Uh, I'm so interested to finish this FISA uh, because it will add to me value as uh, all my experience in audit. So it is better to uh, also to add uh, IC, uh, IS audit. Okay. So, Hamad, where are you based at? Sudan? Yeah, I'm from Sudan. I'm Sudanese. Okay. okay. It's very nice meeting you. Okay, so... okay, so Me are, too. So okay, you are planning to take the examination in September? Actually, in June. Okay, June. Okay, fine. Okay. okay. Then, Mohammed, go ahead, dear. Hi, dear. Hi, everyone. I am from London, and... Uh, Basically, I'm an ACCA qualified uh, accountant, and I do a lot of uh, financial audits. So I decided to do CISA as to gain some all-round experience as far as IT audits are concerned, and I plan okay. to take the exam in September. Uh, you're planning to take the exam in September? September, yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Then, good time. Peter, I know you, but let the class know you again. Please introduce yourself, sir. Sure. Hi, uh, Jit, and hi, everyone else. <coughs> uh, my name is Peter Rosario. I'm from Pune. Uh, I'm a senior uh, IT operations manager handling uh, nine different countries' offices that we have. Uh, I had been to the previous class of CISA also. Uh, unfortunately, I had missed a few of them, starting the first one also. So I'll be repeating myself. Uh, I might be going in for the CISA uh, the exams. That might be in September. So that's, that's all from me. Okay, thank you. Then Rajeshree. Yeah, hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Rajeshi. So I'm basically from Bangalore, India. So I'm a company okay. city, working in a construction company. Okay. Okay, and I'm planning to uh, sit for the exam in September. Okay. Then Sandeep? Uh, I guess, hi. Hi everyone, good morning and good evening. Uh, th this is Sandeep, I'm from Noida, India. Uh, well, I've done B.Tech in Electronics and Communication and Postgraduate Diploma in Computing. Uh, well, I've got uh, 12 years of experience 
out of which 10 years of experience is in regulatory compliance uh, so well, i am working in ibm india private, private limited and well i may uh, well i am plan to will take over the cs exam in september okay sandeep sandeep good to hear that someone is from delhi so i am also from delhi <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> okay Then, then those. Hey, hi everyone. Hi Jit. How are you doing? Hi, I'm fine, sir. Great. Um, this is Santosh. Um, I've been a service delivery manager for 13 years now, and I'm based out of London. Uh, okay. rather, I should say, I just moved into London. Uh, maybe a year back. Uh, before that, I was uh, primarily in India, so all my experiences primarily is in India. So I'm picking up on CISA because being in service delivery management, I guess you know it also talks about a lot of um, you know quality based and audit based and the service uh, in how the service could be controlled and managed uh, and delivered. So that becomes an important uh, facet for service delivery. So that's the reason to get into uh, CISA. Uh, and also in the last couple of years, I've been working in technology. the risk divisions uh, primarily as you said as uh, the, the SOC kind of a setup uh, so that makes me in you know, a mood towards uh, you know getting this certification and of course i'm planning in september i hope i have uh, i have enough time to do that uh, yeah, it's yeah. been quite quite some time being in the you know classroom based uh, training and also sitting here and reading through the books <laughs> so of course and, uh, i work for goldman sachs okay Right. Yeah, and then Mohammed, I think, sir, I think we should meet up because I'm based in London, and since you have loads of uh, audit experience, I think it will be a good uh, chat with you, and it's a good reach. Okay, so okay. let's move to Suma. Ah, Suma, yeah, Suma, go ahead with your introduction, dear. Hi everyone. Uh, uh, myself Somit. Uh, I'm working for uh, oil and gas company, and uh, I'm planning to uh, do CISA certification in September. Oh. So fine. And uh, actually uh, the oil and gas company is my client side. I am originally uh, uh, based in India but currently deputed to Houston. Uh, so uh, it will be great to you know uh, do the classroom trainings and uh, uh, get to know each of everyone sharing their experiences and uh, it's it's better as uh, someone said to you know go through books and uh, to do some th- this kind of session so uh, i would like to uh, you know uh, uh, i would like to uh, just uh, share uh, some of the, the uh, uh, experiences that uh, uh, which is you know helpful for everyone as well as i'll come to know from everyone as well so this will be a great okay. session thank you okay Okay, let's start. Fine. Uh, so I have everyone has given the introduction. Okay, so let's start with our actual game domain. So in Peter Gregory book, this is domain. Uh, this is chapter number two. So I want you to study along with me for for the next one month. Five domains in a month. It's achievable for you also. Even if you are working, so we can take our time. Okay, so we have decided. to take the examination so we have to take out time and manage you have to take out time for your study so that you can right, so so that you can pass the examination so domain so study along with me okay uh, for the next one month so today i will be starting with domain one that is process of auditing information system this domain revolves around five topics i tell you so if you what are those five topics this is the important topic list that i have made for myself may for you people so if you remember peter has has had the access so this domain revolves around these topics audit process okay what audit process is all about okay the different types of audit process what different types of auditing and all those stuff then second domain a second most important topic is risk assessment okay i'm just starting with i've just started with domain one only so don't worry about that okay so this is you know whole domain will revolve around this six important topic that is audit process pretty simple no rocket science nothing then you have a risk assessment okay under risk assessment we will be studying the type of risk okay the type of risk assessment methods okay then after that we will be studying controls controls are basically are basically the counter measures that you are putting into play in order to assess the in order to contain the risk in order to mitigate the risk The next important topic is about sampling. 
okay the so sampling you know it's not sometimes it is not possible for you to to uh, to look at the whole population so what we do in order to infer the characteristics of in order to infer the useful information out of that population we select some sample okay so that is sampling so sampling is of judgmental sampling and non judgmental sampling and there are many other things that i will be covering in sampling very important topic then you have a control self assessment okay when you talk about the control self assessment so in this you know the auditor acts as a facilitator so i will be covering all those things and then computer assisted auditing technique when you talk about computer assisted auditing technique the other name for that is continuous auditing so this is normally used in those cases where paper trail is not possible just like take example if you are to audit if you are going for audit of hr related process so in that case you can easily have you can easily see the hiring form you can easily see the background verification file okay you can easily uh, look out for the for the interview forms and also paper based trail is possible but if you are to audit if you have been given a task to audit the online application just like online application or or, or a application which is calculating the salary of an employee the uh, the uh, the id system which is calculating the salary of an employee so in that case no paper trail is there no audit paper trail is there you it's because everything is into a online form everything is computerized so in that case you have to use the computer assisted techniques you have to use computer or it to audit those process so we call it a computer assisted audit technique or continuous auditing so all chapter you know revolves around these things audit process risk assessment controls the types of curve because you know controls are the counter measures that you are putting into place in order to mitigate the risk <clears throat> okay so there are many types of controls i will be explaining it to you all the things then sampling controls self assessment and cash so these are the six important topics that we will be covering in domain 1 okay so before we start i will give you before we start our actual course some fundamentals i would like you to, i would like to give you an introduction of some fundamental things that you should know about security then please let me know whenever you feel that i am going fast or, or you are not able to understand anything please let me know that okay so before going our because before for any security person because some of you are from and not from information security background it's quite a simple thing for us but for the person who is not from a it background who is just about to start their career in information security so these things these are the basic fundamentals that one should know about security okay so when you talk about security when you talk about security security you know there are three fundamentals of security and we call it a triad of security so whatever security you are applying in your organization suppose you have implemented some access control you have implemented some two factor authentication you have implemented the firewall so all those things should be you know implemented by keeping these three basic principles in mind so there are three basic fundamentals of security please remember it that if we remember it we call it a cia we call it a cia confidentiality integrity and availability we call it a cia a trier confidentiality means that only authorized person should be able to see the data protection of information within a system so that unauthorized people resources and processes cannot access that information so confidentiality means only the authorized person should be able to read or access that information no unauthorized person resources or processes should be able to read the data for which it is for which it is not intended so remember one thing confidentiality there are many ways by which you can ensure confidentiality okay so confidentiality can be ensured by encrypting your data okay so you know that and what is encryption you know what is encryption whatever i am telling you in class whatever i am telling you in class it's all with every word every sentence i'm telling you every concept that i'm telling you maybe right now it is not in the part of this domain but later on it will be there so what i want that so whatever some points come or some topic comes i would like you to give, i i would give the introduction at that time only so that when in detail that the domain comes so you will not be like oh what is this i am doing this for the past time so confidentiality you know is a process by which you make sure that only the authorized process person or system should be able to access the resources no unauthorized person should be able to do that confidentiality can be achieved with the help of encryption 
Look, encryption is a process by which you can convert your plain text. Encryption is a process by which you can convert your plain text into the cipher text, and then when the data reaches other end, you decrypt your data at the receiver end. So make sure that means you are encrypting and decrypting the data with the help of a key. So con un confidentiality can be achieved with the help of encryption by applying access control. What do you understand the access control? Access control, you know, are the first line of defenses. It makes sure that the, only the authenticated person should be able to access the data. So just like whenever, just like take example, simply learn whenever you when you were when you were logging for the course, you have to give your username and password. Okay, so that username and password, if when you get yourself when you get it authenticated, so the, the main purpose of that is to make sure that the person who have given the fees and enrolled for the course should be able to access this course content. Then next thing is integrity. Okay, integrity. Look, confidentially will make sure that the authorized person should be able to read or access the data. Integrity makes sure that the data has not been tampered. Protection of information system processes from intentional or accidental unauthorized changes. So it makes sure that the data has not been tampered. As you know there are two kinds of data, data in front. You have to protect data in two forms. Data in transit and data at rest. So right now my data is there in a laptop. Okay, so this is your data at rest. And when you talk about the data in transit, when you are sending your data from one system to another, so that is your data in transit. Okay, so integrity means you have to make sure that that data has not been, you have to protect your data from intentional or accidental unauthorized changes. Because it's not like that, that everyone, that changes in the data, that, that, that data gets changed because of intentional damage. Some people, they, they infect you, they try to infect your system with malware, virus, and what is the main function of malware virus? What they do, they infect the system and make the changes to the data. Okay, they corrupt your file so that it will not be available to you. So, main thing is that you have to protect your data from intentional or un un accidental unauthorized changes. So that can be done with the help of hashing. Okay, that can be done with the help of hashing. Are you aware of hashing concept? Okay, I tell you that what is hashing? How it how it protects how it protects from uh, how it could look all these things all these things will be there in the if you're not getting anything if you just get a fraction of it then then also it will be fine with me because i will be covering all these things in my coming class so you don't need to worry about that because you know whenever you read something for the first time one of my one of my teachers told me when you're reading something if you're not getting anything but you want to read it read it quickly so even if you understand two or three percent of that then also it will be fine because when you and then when you read that domain again for the next time, so two or three percent that you have learned or understand right now will serve as a basis for that. So hashing, I told you what it works. Hashing is the way by which the system makes sure that the data has not been tampered or or, or modified during the transit. How it works? Suppose you are sending some data. Suppose the data is A B C. Please try to understand. Suppose you are sending some data A B C. My, I'm, my, me and Mohammed are doing the communication. I'm sending some data to the Mohammed. So suppose I'm sending ABC to Mohammed. So that ABC will be feed into an algorithm, mathematical algorithm. There are two algorithms available. One is MD5. I tell you that. There are two hashing algorithms available. MD5, okay, SHA. So there are two algorithms available, MD5 and Shaw. These are the mathematical algorithms. You feed your data into this algorithm. Okay. And a fixed length digest. Remember, fixed length digest. Fixed length digest is nothing but they are the random numbers, random key you can say there, random nuance of words. Okay, fixed length digest, random nuance of words will be generated. Okay, for suppose for ABC or CBA is generated, you will append this fixed length digest to the data, to the ABC. Okay, and send, I will append this data, append this digest CBA to the ABC and send it to Mohammed. When Mohammed receives that data, ABC along with the digest, he will remove the digest, he will remove the digest CBA, and again feed this data that he has received from me into an algorithm, the same algorithm, whether MD5 or Shaw, and again a fixed length digest will be created. If both the digests are same, the digest that Mohammed received from Ajit and the digest that he has calculated from the data which has, data that he has received from Ajit, if both the digests are same, so this ensures integrity means a person is not able to means the data has not been tampered so does that make sense everyone
So all these things will be there, so you don't need to worry about that. Why I, because the things come, then I try to explain at this point also. Yes, you can say that. Same with digital signature. Okay, then availability. Then availability is assuring that the computer system is accessible by authorized users whenever needed. So, you know, whenever you talk about security, so security should be measured from these three principles only. So sometimes, you know, confidentiality is important. Sometimes integrity is important. So just like if you're doing a transaction from one system to another, you're transferring some money from one system to another. So they are, they are the integrities of integrity and confidentiality of us most important. So someone, let's take an example, you are doing a share, some share broker in the in the share market. What is interested in? The system should be available. He's least bothered about the confidentiality, he's least bothered about the integrity, or he's least bothered about the confidentiality, and he's more interested in availability. So depending on your requirement, means, you know, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability can be altered and can be tweaked. So these are the three basic fundamentals of security. Let me know. Sorry, Banka, this is not about public and private key encryption. Public and yes, ah, okay, you're talking about, this is one of the facility that private and that asymmetric key cryptography provides, that is your hashing. Okay, so public and private key encryption are different, so I will be covering that later on. So this is different. Okay, then there are certain security definitions that one should know about. Basic definitions, but you know, all your syllabus or your course revolves around these things. Okay. So assets, assets is any information, hardware, software, equipment that is utilized for and critical to the, okay, give me a minute, give me a minute, let me cover this topic, the small topic, then I will explain you hashing again. Okay, give me a minute. Okay, so assets, any information, hardware, software, equipment that is utilized for and critical to service delivery, this is objective and financial success. So assets, just like me, means I am working as a resource in, in, in my department, which, which is providing which providing security services, so I'm also an asset. Uh, anything, system, software, anything that is providing services and if it's of critical to service delivery business objectives, they are called assets. So assets, not only IT assets, the people, they are also assets to an organization. Anything that holds value from this CIA perspective is an asset. Then vulnerability, remember, vulnerability is very, very important. Vulnerability is any weakness in a system. Any software, hardware, or procedural weakness. Remember, any hardware, software, or procedural weakness in a system that may provide an attacker at the open door he's looking for. Just like, take an example, your antivirus is not updated. When antivirus is not updated, so this is a vulnerability because that gives an attacker or a hacker to hack your system. Let's take an example, real world example. My vitamin means I have a deficiency of vitamin D in my body. So that is a vulnerability. Because, you know, that makes my body vulnerability, vulnerable to bone related diseases. Okay, so vulnerability is any hardware, software, procedural weakness. It's not about anti malware or anti system is not updated. So, lots of, sometimes, you know, a lot of people while programming, the developers, what they do, uh, they do the, they, they write the comments while doing the programming. So, you know, that comment also can also reveal the very useful information about the software or an application. So this all comes under the categories of vulnerability. So any weakness in the system that can give an attacker an open door to attack your system is your vulnerability. Okay? Then comes threat. Any potential danger to the information system. So when I say that, when, when I say that, just, just like what if someone is having HIV positive, okay, so HIV positive, you know, it makes your body vulnerable. It's not a kind of, you know, it's not a kind of disease. It What it does, your 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 white blood cell stops working and it makes your body vulnerable to plethora of diseases. So, so and when HIV, when your body is HIV positive, so you make your body, your body is vulnerable. In that case, you get, so they, what are the different threats? You may get, you know, uh, you may get affected with infected with you may get TB. You may your your bone starts weakening. So there are certain threats to it. Okay. So when when you say the one and another IT example, if I talk about antivirus is not updated. So when antivirus is not updated, so what are the threats to it? Vulnerability is my vulnerability is that antivirus is not updated. But what are the threats to it? What are the threats? So threat will be a hackers can hack your system and and steal useful information from your system. Your, your system may get infected with virus. So these are the threats that you have. Yes. Okay. Then threat agents. 
an entity that takes advantage of that vulnerability. So if I continue with the previous example, if a hacker hacks your system using that vulnerability, so then hacker will be your threat agent. Okay. Then come risk. So risk, it is a likelihood of a threat agent taking advantage of vulnerability and corresponding business impact. So in simple words, if we talk about, always remember, risk is the probability. Okay, risk is the probability, the product of, risk is the product of probability of occurrence and the corresponding business impact. Risk is the product, remember, risk, this is a basic definition, risk is the product of probability of occurrence and corresponding business impact. i tell you what it is. Continuing with my previous example, my antivirus is not updated. So what is the probability that my system gets infected with virus or my system gets hacked? The probability can be, you know, high, medium, low. Which like just like you can categorize this thing, high, medium, low. Then what will be the impact if my antivirus gets infected, if my system is not in my system, my antivirus is not updated, then my system may get infected. So what will be the impact? Whether it's a high, medium, low. So that so it's a product of probability of occurrence and its impact. So what are the chances that that the threat agent will take advantage of that vulnerability and what will be the corresponding business impact? So I want to give one example. Uh, in 2008, I, when I was working with Excite, no. Threat is any entity. Okay, threat is, you know, any potential danger to the information system. Okay, any potential danger to the information system. If your system is not updated, okay, antivirus is not updated, then a hacker ha may hack your system. So that is a threat. That is a threat. But when you talk about the risk, risk is the probability of occurrence. Risk is the probability of pro product of probability of occurrence and its corresponding business impact. Okay, so if 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 antivirus is not updated, if system attacks my system, if if a hacker, if a threat is to be taken place, like if my 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 hacker hacks the system, so what is the risk? Risk is the product of probability of occurrence and its impact. When you talk about probability of occurrence, what are the chances that a hacker hacks a system? So my antivirus is not updated, so chances are very high that my and my system gets hacked. And when it gets hacked, what will be the impact? The impact depends on type of system. Okay, so impact can be high, medium, low, depending on the type of a system. So just like I want to give one example, means in 2008 when I was working was excited, there was a virus outbreak. So so that virus was affecting user system. So when user system was, was was getting affected, the impact was not very high. The impact was not very high. But later on what happened, one day we got a news that the, the server, the antivirus server, which was responsible for controlling the antivirus in the whole environment got infected. So that, you know, the impact was very, very high. So it is the product of Probability of occurrence, what are the chances that the, this threat takes place, that threat they hacks your system, and what will be the impact if that threat exploits your vulnerability? So that is your risk. It's the product of probability of occurrence, okay, product of probability of occurrence, and its corresponding business impact. So that is your risk. It is not similar to threat. Threat is different. Threat is the way, threat is the agent. So threat is that. Means threat is different. And, and risk is different. Risk is the likelihood. So remember, this is very important from examination point of view. It's very important from examination point of view. What is so risk? Risk is the product of probability of occurrence. Which, what are the chances that it will occur and the corresponding business impact? So you know, risk can be uh, risk can be uh, risk can be you know there are different ways of risk assessment like quantitative or qualitative risk assessment. I will be explaining it to you. Then exposure. So it is an instance of being exposed to losses from a threat agent, okay? So what is the exposure? So if my, if my antivirus gets, in, if my system gets infected, so what are the losses that I will be having? So the 25% system efficiency will be reduced. So that is your exposure. If I say that uh, uh, there is a warehouse, okay, there is a warehouse, and if the warehouse gets caught fire, catches fire, then 25% of the warehouse will be damaged. So that is your exposure factor. Okay, so then countermeasures or safeguards means they are the controls that you're putting into place 
to mitigate the potential risk. So any questions on this, yes? Okay. So, okay. So my friend Mohammed has asked for hashing. Okay. So, so I tell you what is hashing. Okay. So please bear with me. So what happened is, okay, hashing is what? Suppose hashing is the way by which hashing is the way by which you uh, uh, hashing is the way by which you make sure that the data is not being tampered. Okay, so data is not being tampered. Uh, so in this case, what you do? Suppose let's take an example. I am sending some data to Mopper. Okay, so data is A B C or something like some letter I'm sending A B C. Let's take an example. So what I will do? I will feed that data into an algorithm. I will feed this data into an algorithm that there are two algorithms called MD5 or SAW, whichever you want to use. Suppose I have taken MD5. So I feed this data into algorithm, and suppose ABC have feed into, and then the data, uh, then a fixed length digest will be created. We call it a CBA, anything that has been created. So let's take example CBA. I will append this digest, that is fixed length digest, to the data, to the data that I'm sending to Mohammed. Okay, so when the data reaches Mohammed, he will have the data, that Ajit has sent into him and the digest that it has received. Okay, so then he will re then he will remove that digest. That is, he will remove that digest, and then what he will do is he will remove the digest and then again feed the data into an algorithm, MD5 algorithm, and again a digest will be created. A digest is nothing but it's a it's a secret nuance of number, uh, any secret nuance of number. So when and then those two di the digest that it has been received from Mohammed that received from Aji and the digest that it has created right now will be compared. If if there is no change into the digest, then the data has not been tampered. If the digest has changed, then this means that someone has tampered your data. So does that make sense, Mohammed? Risk is leading to viral threat is exposure. I didn't get your question, Banka. Uh, yeah, threat is related to, you know, risk is leading to risk is the probability of occurrence. Risk is the probability of occurrence of product of probability of occurrence and impact. Okay, and exposure. Exposure means how much, means how much will, means what will be the, what I say, that means suppose 25% will be damaged, 50% will be damaged, so that is exposure. That is exposure. Then controls. Look, controls are of different types. Controls are basically you have the countermeasures that you are putting into place in order to mitigate the risk. Okay, so you have a risk. The controls, you know, it is the next step after the uh, after the risk assessment and all. So there are different categories of control: administrative controls, technical control, and physical control. So when you talk about administrative controls, okay, so they are commonly referred to as soft controls because they are more management oriented. Okay, so they are more management oriented. So all the administrative controls like security document, the, the categories are security documentation. You have the security policies in place, the risk management, personal security and training. So they are all comes under the administrative control. We call it a soft control. So you know your organization they conduct social awareness training. You have a security policies in place. You have a risk management in place. You have the governance in place, the structure which is there to make sure that the, uh, your system is in IT is in alignment with the business, they, they, they all come under the administrative control. Next one is about technical control. Okay, technical controls are what? They're also called the logical controls as software hardware components. So they, firewalls, ideas, anti-malware, they all come under the technical control. So what is firewall basically? Firewall is a device, okay, remember, firewall is a device or a group of devices which manages access between two or more networks, okay? So, which manages access between two or more networks. So, so okay, the firewall can be of different types, so I will be explaining all those things in detail in the next class. Then you have ideas. Basically, firewall, you know, is a preventive device. It's a preventive control, you can say that, because it is used to prevent any events from occurring. So just like it is used to prevent any hacker from attacking your system, from passing any other malware into your system. So that all comes under that. Or that is comes under preventive control. Then comes your ideas and prevention system. Remember, these are the monitoring devices. Okay, which is used to these. These are the monitoring devices which is used to monitor your network, monitor your traffic that is coming in and going out of your network. Then you have an anti-malware. 
So first of all, before anti-malware, I would like you to explain malware. Malware is any malicious code. Any malicious code that can harm your system is a malware. There are different kinds of malware. Viruses, bombs, virus, bombs, Trojan horse, spyware, logic bomb. They all come under polymorphic virus. They all come under malware. So all these things are there in a later class. So when I talk about viruses, so virus basically different kinds of malware. The virus basically are, are the uh, virus are the malicious content. Okay, so and they're the malicious content, but and which has the capability to move from one system to another on its own. So viruses doesn't require any carrier to move from one system to another. They are they can self replicate. Then comes your worm. Okay, another category of anti malware. I will be explaining all those things into the into domain five. So, but it has come across. So I'm just telling you some basics of it. Then comes and then comes worm. Worm is very similar to virus. It is also malicious code. But the problem with worm is that they cannot self replicate. They cannot self replicate. They require a carrier to move from one system to another. So that is your worm. Another one is Trojan horse. Trojan horse is basically it is a malware which appears useful to a person okay so in the first attempt in the first in the first instance when the person sees that trojan horse he says okay it is, this is something useful for me i should look into it but when it clicks that it, it it it's a virus it, it's a malware so just like take an example remember i don't remember the actual year but there was an attack called i love you virus okay so every lot of people had received an email into their Email box with the with the subject line of I love you. So that appears useful to the person. People get fascinated, attracted by that. Okay, what is that? Someone has sent you an email by the name I love you. Let's open it. But when they opened it, that infected their system. So that is your know Trojan horse. Then fourth one is your polymorphic virus. Okay, polymorphic virus has the ability to change the code when they move from one system to another. So they changes the code when they move from one system to another. So that is your polymorphic virus. Another one is logic bomb. Okay, logic bomb is a virus which 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 executes when some particular condition becomes true. So there are different kinds of anti malware viruses. Okay, it is very similar. Virus is a malicious force which has the ability to move from one system to another on its own, and they don't require any carrier to replicate. They can replicate on its own. Then you have a bomb. Very similar to virus, but they have a capability to replicate from one system to they have they don't have means they require a carrier to move from one system to another. Then you have a uh, then you have your Trojan horse. It is a code which appears useful to you, but in reality it, it is a virus. The Trojan horse has been taken its name from the movie Troy. If someone has seen the movie Troy, in that movie, if you see uh, uh, the, uh, there was a gate. What they did means they they built a uh, they built a wooden horse, which called the Trojan horse, and all the people, all the, all the soldiers were get to be hidden in that, and they entered by by become by hidden in that thing. So that is your Trojan horse. Then you have a polymorphic virus. The polymorphic virus, you know, they change its code when they move from system to another. Okay. Then you have a A logic bomb, so which it is a virus that executes when some particular condition gets true. Okay, then one another thing is there's a spyware. The spyware, you know, they stay they they stay hidden in your they they stay hidden they remain hidden in your system and used to gather useful information about system your passwords and everything and pass it on to the server. So these are certain kinds of malware basically. So anti malware like you have anti viruses, anti spyware installed. Then you have a access control. Okay, access control are the first line of defense by which you make sure that only your five people should be able to uh, access the data. Uh, access the data. So access control, you know, it's a way by which an object, subject access object. When you talk about the subject, it's the means. It's the means by which a subject access object. When you talk about subject, just like I, I am accessing my system, so I am the subject and my system is an object. So that you are governing the rules by which the subject access object. So there are different kinds of access control model. We have mandatory access control model, discretionary. So these are certain things. Then you have encryption. I've already explained to you encryption. Can access control be physical access control too? Yes, it can be. Right? It can be because you know the the 
uh, what I say is the access card reader. The access card reader on that that's a physical control. The access card reader that is there on our uh, on our entry door. Uh, that is a kind of physical control also. Okay. Then comes encryption. Yes. So then comes encryption. Encryption, you know, it is the way by which you convert your plane. The encryption is the way by which yes. USB to USB land, something like that, by right? true. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so I will be this, this is just a basic, I'm just I've just started the thing. So all these things will be in, in, in the coming classes. Okay, so because you know some people are not from technical background. So when we study the when we actually read those topics, so people will not feel that they have reading for they are reading it for the first time. So they should have some previous background. So that's why I'm explaining all these things here also in detail. So then comes encryption. Okay, so encryption basically is a process of converting the plain text into the cipher text. Okay, so there are two kinds of encryption, remember, there are two kinds of encryption. One is symmetric encryption and other one is asymmetric. When you talk about symmetric encryption, okay, so symmetric encryption, you know, you are using the same key. You are using the same key for encryption as well as decryption. So suppose me and and, and Sajinder are coming, okay, we want to send some data into a, into an encrypted form. So in a symmetric form, what I will be doing, I will be using a key, okay, and Sajinder should be having the same key with himself. So I should be having a two instances of the same key. I should be having a two instances of the same key. So what will happen is, means I will be encrypting the data, so Sajinder will be decrypting the data using the same key. So the problem with this is that it can only ensure you confidentiality. No authentication, no non-repetition cannot be there. Why? Because you know, and moreover, it is not very scalable. Suppose me and Sajinder are communicating one pair of key I need to have, then me and Mohammed are communicating, then one pair of key I need to have. Then me and Santosh are communicating, fine. Then also I need to have another pair of key. So fine if we're having 10 people, then it's okay, we can have 10 separate keys. But what will happen if I am dealing with 100 people? The formula, the number of keys is n is equal to n minus. n is equal to number of keys that you require is n equal to n, mi n, n minus 1 upon 2. So if you're dealing with 100 people, okay, if you're doing the communication with 100 people, so 100 into 100 minus 1 upon 2 is the number of keys that you need to have. So that creates a problem. So that's why another encryption comes is asymmetric encryption in which you use in which you use a combination of private key and public key. Okay, suppose me and Muhammad are communicating. So private key means I will be having a private key that I will be keeping it with myself. And public key is a key which I can exchange it, which I can exchange it publicly. So what happens is, means if I have encrypted some data with a private key of mine, so that can only be decrypted. Look, private and public key of person or, or an entity is mathematically correlated. But it, it mathematical correlation doesn't mean that, mathematical correlation doesn't mean that, that, that if you know someone's public key, then you will be able to derive the private key out of it. No. They are mathematically correlated, but if you know the public key, then you will not be able to derive the private key out of it, of, of that. So if I'm encrypting the data using a private key of mine, so that only been encrypted using a public key of mine. So depending on what type of services you require, what type of services you require, you can go for that. Okay? So these are technical controls. Then comes under the physical control. Physical controls are the items which you put into place to protect facility, personal, and resources. The example of our senses, dog doors, closed circuits, security guards, these are examples of physical controls. Then, control based on functionality. So look, in this book means there are many codes, many topics which, which require great deal of explanation and I'm, I will be giving much time to it. But there are certain theory related topics which doesn't require greater understanding, so I will not be giving much time. So based on my importance and all, I will be giving much time to the topic. So control based on functionality. So you have seen the categories of control. Then control based on functionality. So control can be categorized also on the basis of functionality, how they work. So one is a deterrent control. So intended to discourage a potential attacker. The best example of this is if if, if a thief if, if a thief is looking into the area looking for some house to, to to break into. So when he sees some house which having a which is having a strong law, a iron door, a strong iron door. So that, you know, that can discourage or deter, deter an attacker or thief to break into that house. 
Okay, so that is a comes a different. So if someone, so let's take an example, if someone tries to uh, uh, break into your organization and if we see the security, you have a bollard available, uh, you have a guard available with machine guns and everything. So that comes as a deterrent. So that, that controls, that serves as a discourage, that, that deters a potential attacker from attacking a system is a deterrent control. Then comes preventive control, which is intended to avoid an incident from occurring. The best example of preventive control is the best example of preventive control is your your firewall. Firewall is a preventive control. Okay, so firewall sometimes you know they act as one control can may may act as a deterrent and preventive control at the same time. So just like your firewall is acting as a preventive control, but it may act as a deterrent control also. But let's give the example. So suppose an attacker sees means during the reconnaissance phase. You know reconnaissance is a phase during which reconnaissance reconnaissance is a phase during which an attacker tries to find out means tries to do the right key. You know. So if someone wants to just like if you are uh, we ha uh, we are all living in a very volatile environment, so just like if someone wants to do some terrorist attack, just like if you remember in 26 by 11 attack in India, so you do they do the reconnaissance of the recce of of that area to find out which are the points, which are the break points, and what are the vulnerable points and all. So reconnaissance is a phase which during which an attacker tries to find the uh, as much as information about the target before launching an actual attack. So what happens is before during the reconnaissance phase, an attacker finds out there is a strong firewall that uh, there is a strong firewall in place, the, the latest firewall in place. So that is acting as a preventive control, but it also acts as a deterrent control. Okay, there is a firewall. I will require much more time and resources to break into that network. Okay, leave it. In. Leave it. In. Okay, so that is you know acting as a, a one control may be acting as a deterrent as well as a preventive control at the same time. That corrective control. Fixed components of systems after the incident has occurred. Then recovery intended to break the regular environment uh, and bring the environment back to the regular operation. Then comes detective controls. The best example of detective control are the system logs. Then you have a compensating control that provides an alternate measure of control. So these are the controls which is based on functionality. Any questions on this? Okay, another last topic, then I will move to the slides. What means I will move to the internal slides. Okay, then defense in depth. Do you know defense in depth approach? Okay, I tell you that. Have you ever seen a military <coughs> have you ever seen a military organization? In a military organization, uh, uh, have you been in a military organization if you try to enter the military organization, okay, so with a valid pass. So is it like that? that you show the entry pass or you get authenticated at one place and you get access to everything? No. They have a label, they have a difference in each and every label, at each and every area where you want to enter. In the similar way, when you talk about the security, security should always follow the difference in depth approach. When you talk about the difference in depth approach, then there should be a security at each and every label. So if you talk about the normal architecture of a technical architecture of, of, any, secure, of any company, so you will be having, just take an example, you will be having an ISP router first. Okay, then after ISP router, you will be having a firewall, a parameter firewall. You know, parameter, when you talk about a parameter, parameter is the area, parameter devices are the devices which segregate your internal and external network. Okay, so then you have a parameter firewall. Okay, then you, after the parameter firewall, you will be having a corporate firewall. Okay, so which is protecting your corporate network. Then you have a VPN device, that is virtual private network devices, which is used to connect your device, which is used to connect your network, which is used to connect, to, which is used to communicate to your, which is a device which is used for communicating with your external network or for a remote access VPN. Then after that, you will be having an IPS IDS devices, which is used to monitor the traffic that is going in and out of the network. Then you need to have your host-based intrusion system, okay, HIDS, HIPS, which is used to protect your host system. Then you need to have an access control system in place by which you can authenticate and authorize your system. Then you need to have, uh, you know, policies and procedures in place which is used to protect your network. So all these, you know, depends in depth. You need to have a multiple control available in your organization so successful penetration and compromise is more difficult to attend. So just like if someone, it's not like that. If someone is coming in, try to hack your system, 
So if 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 he pass across, if he try, if he has if he successfully if he successfully compromise your firewall, then he will be having access to everything. No, if he, even if he has successfully compromised my uh, my uh, you know the parameter firewall, then there behind the parameter firewall, I will be having a corporate firewall. Then after corporate firewall, I will be having a IDs and IPs. Then I will be having an access control enabled on the web server. Okay, the actual server in which he is trying to access to. Providing means having a multiple control so that the successful penetration and compromise is more difficult to attain. Just like take example, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, if you talk about the prime minister security, prime minister security. So it's not like that. Only you have a one layer of defense. So one layer of defense is by SPG. Then you have means you have multiple layers of defense. So even if someone tries to break into that, so he has to cross several layers of security if he wants to attack the VIP. So that is your defense in that. Okay, so security always, you know, it always follows a defense in depth approach. Okay, so does it make sense, everyone? Okay, rule based access control and account management. Look, account management. If you know, so someone has joined the organization, his account needs to be created. His account needs to be created, deleted, and has and has been given right. That is, you know, account management. We also call it a provisioning. We also call it a provisioning. And access rule means if someone means you have created the rules. Like this one should be given access, and this should and this should be given access only on these things. You know that is you know rule based access control. So first, so you know every topic when you talk about yeah. so every topic you know in CISA first domain is about process of auditing information. In this, as I told you, I have given you five more five important topics. One is maybe six important topics. One is about you know audit process. Second is about control self assessment. Controls, risk assessment, and CSA. These are the topics. Stand sampling. These are the topics that I will be covering in this domain. Okay. So every domain is being divided into task and knowledge statement. So first one is the knowledge statement, the knowledge that you need to have. Okay. And task statement is what our candidate is expected to know how to perform. So knowledge statements are those that these students should have a good grasp to perform the task. A task statement for what a CISA candidate is expected to know how to perform. So task and knowledge statement, you know, uh, maintain the process. So one, so one knowledge statement under one knowledge statement, you need to perform the different tasks. Let's take example the knowledge statement of your risk assessment. So under that, you need to perform the different tasks like vulnerability assessment, threat assessment, and then quantitative and qualitative risk assessment. So different tasks that you need to perform under one knowledge statement. So under this, you know, under this knowledge statement. You we will be studying the guidelines, procedures, guidelines, procedures, and standards. So Izaka has laid down certain standards, guidelines, and procedures that one should be knowing in order to perform the audit. So there are approx, you know, there are approx 14 guidelines, standards, and procedures that I will show to you. As an auditor, me from examination point of view, you don't need to understand, you don't need to memorize those standards, guidelines, and procedures. That's just a way of understanding the thing, and you know. Throughout this topic, throughout this book, we will be covering all those things. Okay, so I will show you what are standards, guidelines, and procedures in the next week in the coming slide. So Izaka has laid down certain code of professional ethics okay, that everyone, every person should be, every audit means Izaka, Tisa person should be following that. So first one, it is pretty theoretical stuff. So no need of great understanding at all. So the stuff that I have covered earlier, so that requires the understanding. But here it's just a pretty, it's just a theoretical stuff that I will be reading it out. The support, the implementation, and encourage compliance with appropriate standards, procedures, and control for the information system. So as an auditor, you should support the implementation and encourage compliance with appropriate standards, guidelines, and procedures. Then perform their duty with due diligence. In accordance with the professional standards and best practices, so this is applicable not only to auditors but everyone. Serve in the interest of stakeholders in the lawful and honest manner, while maintaining high standards of conduct and character, and not engage in any act discreditable to the profession. Maintain the privacy and confidentiality. You know, when whenever you are going for an audit, you get access to lot and lot of confidential things. Okay, so main thing is that you need to be aware. Means you need to. Maintain the privacy and confidentiality. And recently, we have gone through an audit, and you know, we, the when auditor came, we have we have asked him to sign this clause, the confidential privacy clause, so that he because when he when someone do the audit, uh, he will come across and he get the knowledge about all the uh, some 
some patent things and some important things that are very that is very secretive and very useful to my organization. Uh, and so and that should not be disclosed to the outside world in any cases. Just like in BT, we have some tools, we have certain technologies and all that should be with us. So in any case, the auditor should not be able so should not be revealing that information. So we need to maintain the privacy and confidence of information obtained in the course of the duty unless disclosure is required by legal authority. Then maintain competency in the respective field and agree to undertake only those activities that they reasonably expect to complete with professional competence. So it's like that. If you don't come to because you know when you're you are, whenever you're doing for an audit, you need to have the you need to have a competency in that field. Suppose you are going for an audit of security operation center and you are not aware anything about security, so in that case you should not be. Yes, I can tell. So in that case you should not be taking that. Uh, you should not be taking that audit. You should simply say no. So you should be only able to. You should only say yes to those agreement assignments in which you are feeling comfortable and which you have the competence. Inform appropriate parties about the results of work performed, revealing all significant facts known to them. So you know, once you do the audit, once you do the audit, so it's your responsibility to inform all the appropriate parties about the results of work performed and revealing all significant facts. And you should not be hiding any facts with them. Okay. So then support the professional education of stakeholders. So also it's the responsibility of auditor to support the professional education of stakeholders to enhance the understanding of information systems, security and control. Okay. So failure to comply with code of professional ethics can result in an investigation into a member for certification holder content and ultimately in disciplinary action. Okay. So what is the main purpose of audit and assurance? The main purpose is to make sure that the auditor is aware or the minimum levels, because you know you have a assured standard, standard framework and objective available. Okay, the main purpose of this is to make sure that if you make may make IS auditors management aware of the responsibility. So what about IS auditors? So auditors should be aware should be aware of the minimum level of performance required to meet the professional responsibility in the professional code of ethics. When you talk about the management, they should be knowing about the professional requirements regarding the work of original practitioners. So Izaka has laid down certain standards, guidelines, and procedures. I show it to you what are the different standards, guidelines, and procedures. Okay, this is the book normally I follow, and I, you know, very good book. So, like many professionals, Izaka has also means Izaka has laid down their own standards. The Izaka Audit Standard Framework defines minimal standards of performance related to security audits and actions that result from audits. So, there are about 16 standards. Okay, so the first one is about audit charter. I will not be going each and everything in detail. If you want to read, you can read it because you know there are approximately 16 standards, 42 guidelines, and 16, 17 procedures. Not possible for me to uh, take everything one by one. But you know, all those things will be covered in 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 our course. So you don't need to worry about that. All those things will be covered. So let's take an example of audit charter. So audit charter, so audit charter is what? So audit was whatever audit activities in an organization you take, it should be formally defined in audit charter. So audit charter is basically a high level document. Audit charter is basically a high level document which is defined in the beginning, and it includes statements of scope, responsibility, and authority for conducting audit. So remember, this audit charter is basically a document. It's a formal document which scopes authority, responsibility, and scope of audit. Okay, and it should be supported by top level, supported and approved by the top level management. Remember, so if if it is not approved, then you should not be able to take the audit. Then there are standards related to independence. Then they, if you are doing this, the auditor should behave independence of the auditee. Then there are aspects related to ethics and standards. Then professional competence, the IS auditor should possess all the necessary skills and knowledge that are related to process. Then it is related to planning. So IS auditor should perform audit planning, work to ensure the scope and breadth of auditing is sufficient 
to meet the organization needs. So standard five is related to planning, standard six is related to report performance of audit work, then reporting, follow up activity. So you know audit is a uh, is not a one time process. So after the completion of audit, an I uh, auditor should follow up at a later time to determine if the management has taken steps to any recommended changes or apply changes. So the follow up activity should be taken place. Give me a minute. Okay. So then you have irregularity act. Okay. I auditor should have a healthy but balanced acceptance of all the irregularity and illegal acts. Okay, and then you have IT governance, all those things, you know, use of risk assessment in planning. Okay, so audit materiality, so all those things will be covered in the later classes. So they are approximately key standards, you know, audit evidence or IT control and e commerce. So these are 16 standards. Then after standards, you have a guideline. Okay, so guidelines is what? The Exaka audit guidelines contains information that helps the auditor understand how to apply. Is our audit standard. So just like the guidelines will tell you, it helps the auditor, it contains information that helps the IS auditor in applying the standards. So using the work of just like one guideline is related to using the work of other auditors. So what happens is sometimes the auditor needs to use the work of other auditors. So what are the guidelines that he needs to follow if he has to use the work of other auditors? Then guidelines related to audit evidence requirements. So what happens because you know audit evidence is whenever you are doing the audit, you need to gather the evidence to the proof. Okay, so so what in this guideline, what are the details regarding the evidence? If all details evidence can be represented and collecting and gathering evidence. So this all comes under audit evidence requirement guideline. Then you use of computer assistive techniques. So remember, please understand this is a very important topic. I will be covering this in, in this domain only. Computer assisted audit technique and continuous online auditing. Remember computer assisted audit technique and continuous online auditing are same. Okay, don't get confused. So computer assisted technique is by day, day. This is a technique in which we are using system to do the auditing, in which you are making use of computer application sources to do the auditing. So this is normally used in those cases where paper trail, paper, audit paper trail is not possible. And just like in case of if you are to audit any online application system, so in that case you can you will not be having any audit paper trail. So you may and so and for that you need to have a computer system in order to audit the system on in order to audit that application system. So computer assisted audit technique, okay, it is a way but it is a way of doing the audit in which you are making use of system to do the audit. So this is normally used in those cases where paper trail is not possible. Okay, then Outsourcing the bias activity to the organization, what the guidelines? The audit charter have already explained to you. So when these are the guidelines regarding the audit charter. Okay, so as I told you, guidelines, what are they? They, they are the ways by which you can, uh, by which an auditor can find out how to achieve those standards. The materiality concept, due professional care, what are the audit documentation? How do you do the audit documentation? Audit consideration for ir irregular and illegal acts. The effects of pervasive bias control, audit sampling, all those things comes under, you know, they are across 16, uh, 42 guidelines. You can see it over here. There are across 42 guidelines, reporting, business to customer, SGLC review, internal banking, mobile computing. So, you know, all those things, business process ranging, deep review of VPN network, all these things will be covered in my coming classes. If you don't need to worry about that, there are across 42 guidelines. Then procedure. Always remember what is the procedure. Procedures are the step by step. Our, our step by step guide, step by step procedure. Our procedure are step by step thing which helps us in achieving the certain things. So procedures like how you want to do for the risk assessment. What are the procedures? What are the step by step things that you need to follow? So that is you know procedures related to risk assessment, digital signatures, ideas how to review the ideas review. So these you know standard guidelines and procedures are defined by ISAFA. Okay, so you can see it over here, these are the guidelines. Okay, so guidelines using the work of other auditors, how to audit evidence requirements, cash, audit charter, due professional care, and documentation. So there are 14 guidelines. So please don't be worried about that. Or uh, how many questions are asked in regarding to this time? No questions. To be very honest, they will not look these for this DSSP data, they will not they don't want you to memorize the thing. They don't want to memorize the thing. So just like if we go ahead, you will see 
we will be studying all those things, all those things, all those topics. Let's take the example of audit documentation, audit sampling, risk assessment, application system review, planning, all those things I will be covering in a coming class. So you don't need to worry about that. And, and they will not test your knowledge about what is G10 audit all over world. Uh, what is related to G10 audit uh, uh, guidelines. So they will not test you audit what, whether it's audit sampling, pervasive IT control, no. They will not, not test. They don't want you to remember these things. So you don't need to worry about that. Wherever it is important, I will tell you that this is important. Please remember those things. This is not important. This is not at all important from examination point of view. Just a guidance and procedure, and we will be covering all those things in our coming classes. Okay. So then, then you have a Izaka IS ITF framework. There is a separate 200 page guide available. So, IT, uh, Izaka has laid down, sorry, Izaka has laid, has established the standards and guidelines in ITF framework in which they have different sections like 2200, 2400, which is related to performance standards. Then you have a 2600, which is related to reporting standards. So, these are standards. And under this section, they have some sections or sub sections also. If you want, I can share this book with, with you, but that's not important from examination point of view, but yet from knowledge point of view, you can have that. So I will, uh, if someone is a member of Izaka, so that book is freely available to everyone. Okay, so next topic is about risk assessment. That is a very, very important topic. Okay, so let's start with risk assessment. Very important topic and simple, not tough. So easy concepts, the tough, the, the most is Sampling and another topic, sampling and there's another topic called computer system auditing techniques. In that case, you know, you require some understanding and somewhat, because their concept is somewhat difficult to understand. But this is very easy. Risk, you know that, remember one thing you need to remember, risk is, is, risk is basically a product of probability of impact and a corresponding business impact. Remember, from examination point of view, there are two kinds of approaches. One is baseline approach. Okay, there are, there are two kinds of approaches. One is baseline approach, and another one is your risk-based audit approach. Okay, so in baseline approach, you know, in spite of the level of risk, in spite of criticality, you are applying the same level of controls to everything. Okay, it's just like that. In a class, means if you remember, and in the beginning, I, 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 uh, I took an introduction of yours. The main purpose of that introduction is to find out about your background, so that I can define my strategy. I can define my strategy on the, on the. I can define the strategy and see means what what are the different backgrounds that people have, and then I can start teaching. Uh, I can start teaching on the basis of that. In the similar way, means if I don't understand your your background and everything, anything, and what I do, uh, uh, without any understanding of your background, I just follow one simple approach. Okay, I, I will I will cover this slide and fine, I'm done with that. So that's a standard approach. But in a this is called a baseline approach. Means irrespective of the race, irrespective of the importance, you are applying. You have some basic level of security and controls available. You are applying this so called controls and. Uh, you are applying those controls and security to each and every asset in your organization. You are not doing any risk assessment. You are not seeing whether it's important or not. You're just applying the same level of controls and security. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'm not saying so. So, that remember one thing: the two kinds of approaches: baseline approach and a risk-based approach. In a baseline approach, irrespective, irrespective of of your security, irrespective of your organization, you are applying the same level of security controls and approach just like in a class okay so sorry about that so in, in a risk-based audit approach risk-based audit approach what you do normally is uh, you are doing the risk assessment just like take example uh, if you have a budget of ten thousand dollars okay and you have a budget of ten thousand dollars and you have a ten process you have a ten process in your organization in your department and you and within that ten thousand budget what you can do yeah sure uh, within this, uh, within this ten thousand dollar, what you can do is, uh, or you, uh, you can only uh, within this ten thousand dollar, you what you can do, you can only process, you can only audit five processes. So in that case, you know what you need to do is, what you you need to find out the five most important processes which you can do, which can you do the audit. So in that case, what you can do, 
you can do the risk assessment and which one is important and then base and then you apply the controls and then you do the auditing on the basis of that. So that is your risk based audit approach. The main advantage of this is based in this means the controls and the security it's that you're applying it in it's in or it is in accordance with the level of the importance and security. Okay, so under this, you know, we will be covering risk analysis, audit methodology, risk based auditing, risk based auditing. I've just told you that first you do the risk assessment and then on the basis of the risk assessment, you know, you are applying the controls and you're giving the importance according to that. And risk assessment and treatment, reporting techniques follow. So these are the things that we will be covering in this domain. Very, very important one and an easy one, not a tough one. So you don't need to worry about that. So risk analysis is what? Risk is defined as a mixture of or a product of likelihood of an event and its magnitude. Okay? Risk analysis assists an auditor in recognizing vulnerabilities and risks and how they can define control to be put in place to ensure such risks are mitigated. So risk analysis is a process which helps auditor in recognizing a vulnerability. So vulnerability is also one of the prime important things. It's a prime thing of, of any risk analysis and risk and how they can define control. So controls are what they are the countermeasures that they are, that you are putting into place to ensure such risk are mitigated. Okay? Risk is what? It is a mixture of likelihood or a product of likelihood of an event and its magnitude. So IT risk is what? Is specifically the enterprise risk associated with the ownership, use, operation, influence, and adoption of information technology within a business. So this is the, basically we call it the IT risk. Okay, so these are definition of risk. Okay, so you can get the probable frequency and probable magnitude of future loss. Okay, the frequency, how much may, when it can happen, and and what will be the magnitude of a loss, simple thing. Then potential that a threat will exploit vulnerability of an asset or a group, thereby causing harm to an organization. So this is a formal definition of risk as per ISO 27005. So what is the risk analysis process? Okay, so whenever you are doing the risk analysis, there is a process for it. Okay, the first thing is you need to have, you need to understand the business. The first step, remember, we call it a B-O-R-A-R-M-N-R-T. Very, very important, easy one. You don't just an R, you need to understand the concept. So whenever you are, are whenever you are doing the risk analysis of your organization, first thing that you need to do is you need to understand the business, what kind of business you are in, and what is the business objective of your organization. Okay. So in simple words, if I talk about you need to understand the organization. Because the risk analysis varies from organization to organization. If you are in a pharma company, so then your uh, then your business objective here will be different. If you are in an IT related company, just like my company, my business objectives are different. If you are into healthcare industry, the business objectives are different. So in basic trust, in basic language, I talk about when you talk about identify business objectives, you need to understand your organization. What are the uh, we need to understand the organization? Okay, so in this, you know, when you understand the organization, you need to understand all the inherent risk associated with that. Because, you know, there is one risk, we call it an inherent risk. Okay, so inherent risk basically is a risk which is associated with the nature of a business. Okay, so that means just like just like if you are into a military organization, as I told you an example, no matter how many health insurance and everything you got, but there is a risk which is directly associated with the nature of a business. So you need to understand the nature of business. Once you have done that, then you need to identify all the critical assets supporting the BO. So when you talk about the information assets supporting the BO, so that is about the IT assets, the human assets, and all the assets. So suppose, take an example, you are into, uh, just like example of the flip, if you flip card is an organization, it's a flip card. So you need to identify the flip, all the assets, the people, the processes, so there are different processes in a flip card, which, which, which is supporting that business objective, like there's an online portal, and online portal will be again divided into many things. So you need to identify the, all the information assets, which is supporting that view. So for, it consists of two steps, basically, dear. It consists of two steps. One is you need to make the inventory of all the assets, and then you need to find the corresponding business impact of those assets, means what will happen if those goes down. So that is another step. Once that is done, once you have identified the information assets supporting the business objective, then you need to perform the risk assessment of that, that is threat, vulnerability, and impact. So once you have risk and performed the risk assessment, then you need to perform the risk management. Okay, in a risk management, 
means in, in a risk assessment, you find out all the vulnerability. Suppose let's take you find out one vulnerability, uh, one vulnerability related, one vulnerability in which you say the person can, your uh, a person can easily access the access control are not very secure. Okay, are not very secure. So that is one of the vulnerability. Okay, the business uh, another vulnerability you find it out that the backup tapes are not means, means the backup you are not taking regularly. Okay, backups are not being done. So that is also one of the vulnerability. So you find out two vulnerabilities. So in the second case, in the risk management, what you do, you need to map risk with the controls in place. So this is the well, first vulnerability I find out that access controls means a person can easily enter your organization. Obviously. The, the authentication is not very secure. So in that case, what you know, in a risk management, you have to map the controls with the risk. So in that case, you have a controls of access control, or you have a two-factor authentication, then you need to do the risk management, means you have to map your risk with the controls in place. So once that's done, then you can perform the risk treatment. Okay, so risk treatment, there are different options of risk treatment I will be telling you. There is the option of risk mitigation, risk avoidance that I will explain it to you. Okay, so this is all about risk analysis, the process of risk analysis. So the first important thing to remember, first is about identify business objectives. Then you need to identify the information asset supporting the BO. So information asset is not only restricted to your IT asset, but it will be all people and all those processes which are supporting the processes that support the business objective. Then you do the risk assessment in this. You perform the threat vulnerability impact. Then after that, you perform the risk management. Once risk management is done, then you go for the risk treatment. Risk treatment, there are different options of risk treatment. One is your risk avoidance. Another one is risk mitigation. Okay, another one is risk mitigation, then risk transfer, and these are different options for that. Okay. So, what risk analysis, what it does? It helps the auditor identify threats and risks within the NIF environment. It assists in planning by evaluating controls in place. Because, you know, when you do the risk assessment, Okay, so you get an idea about what are the vulnerabilities and threats are there, what are the different threats and vulnerabilities which can affect your organization. Once you get the knowledge of those uh, vulnerabilities, okay, once you get a knowledge of those vulnerabilities and threats, then you can evaluate, okay, let me, I find it out that there is a vulnerability related to, the, uh, there is a vulnerability related to access control. Okay, so a person can easily enter your system without properly getting without getting authenticated properly. In that case, what you can do is what you can do is you can evaluate the controls. Okay, let me okay, this is a vulnerability. Let me know, do you have any controls in place related to this vulnerability? Okay, then you can evaluate the controls in a better manner. This helps the auditor to be in a position to know the audit objective. Okay, so decision making is easier as a risk based methodology is used. So remember two kinds of methodology baseline and our risk based. So we are using risk based methodology. Because that case, you know, that really gives an assurance that uh, the risk based methodology that proper level of proper security controls and security has been applied as per the risk portion of it or risk portion of that uh, of that device or an asset. Uh, I didn't get your portion. This is around technology risk, no any risk. It's not only on the technology risk, it can be any risk. Look uh, to be very honest, if I if you talk about my company, means I have two as team means I am a part of a two five to twenty seven thousand one cycle for two processes. So uh, in that case, you know I, I have used the manual process. Normally there are tools also available because you know I will explain to you there are different kinds of methods for risk assessment. One is a quantitative, another one is a qualitative one. In a quantitative, you know you can have tools available. To be very honest, I'm not I have not seen any tool till now. Because I didn't get an opportunity to work around any risk assessment tool. What I have been doing is, is, is a manual process in which, you know, uh, we have we have a brainstorming session with my lead information security and other team members. And then we do the manual risk assessment of that. Okay, so it depends. It's an automated process also. It's a manual process also. But so it was, that means I didn't get an opportunity. It, I didn't get any opportunity to see any. I know there are tools available for the risk assessment. But I didn't get any opportunity to 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 get exposure to that kind of rule. If in my, if in this class, if someone has uh, seen any risk assessment tool, automated tool, then he can put a light on that. So there are tools available, but normally, you know, people use prefer because you know it should be a mix. People use it because I have seen in my organization, my organization is quite a big one. We have ISO 20000 framework in place, so we are using normally a manual process because that is seems to be a more effective one. 
because in in when a quantitative or average base or a tool you use it's not possible how can you judge the thing that's the problem okay so i have already okay another thing i wanted to explain is calculating risk okay this is basically a quantitative method i told you there are two kinds of risk assessment there are two ways by which you can do the risk assessment one is the quantitative another one is the qualitative one. okay so let me see if some examples are there no we have not given the example okay so give me a minute so till now friends is it clear to everyone everything please let me know if you are not getting or am i getting is my speed fast or or, or you're not or if you want me to improve on something okay so look so so calculating risk so in this basically there are different definitions okay exposure factor single loss expectancy annual an annual rate of occurrence and annualized and annualized loss expectancy so there are two kinds of i told you there are two methods of risk assessment one is a quantitative one and another one is a qualitative one okay so in a quantitative one these things so this is a quantitative way of calculating the risk so there are certain factors there you know there are certain ways by which you can there are certain terminology one is exposure factor okay exposure factor is a percentage of value and asset loss due to an incident so i tell you what is that let's take an example so i will be explaining all those things with the help of example so let's take the there is one warehouse okay there is one warehouse its total value of that warehouse is 1 lakh 50000 okay 1 lakh 50000 dollars okay so that is a asset value fine asset value is 1 lakh 50000 so exposure factor is what suppose a fire is to break place if fire is to take place okay some threat is there of fire and that threat has occurred a fire has break out in a factory so that so due to that fire there was a loss of 25% to that asset okay so that warehouse so exposure factor will be 25% so due to that threat of fire okay that threat was uh, the the threat of the fire has taken place and 25% of the warehouse is affected so in that case exposure factor will be 25% okay is this clear to you then is it clear to you yes okay next move sle sle is equal to cost of a single loss sle okay this is sle sle is a dollar amount try to understand see everything will be more clear with the help of example sle is a dollar amount okay that is assigned to a single event that represent the company potential loss amount if a specific threat were to take place okay is a dollar amount that is assigned to a single event okay if i say fire has taken a fire has occurred okay some building has collapsed or or some or so my server goes down a single event that represent the company's potential loss if a specific threat were to take place sle equal to asset value into exposure factor Expo SLE is equal to asset value into exposure factor. Okay, asset value is the numerical value of an asset. Okay, then exposure factor represents the percentage of a loss a realized threat could have on a certain asset. A percentage of a loss. Suppose I say my system goes down. Okay, so how much loss will I have? Twenty-five percent loss. Twenty-five percent of my revenue that I generate in a day will be affected. in the simpler way let's take example if a, for example if a data warehouse has the asset value of 1 lakh 50000 up to now it's clear it can be estimated that if a fire were to occur if a fire were to occur the 25% of the warehouse would be damaged okay so sle will be sle will be asset value into exposure factor if i am saying 25% of my warehouse would be damaged so exposure factor will be 25% if i say 40% of my warehouse would be damaged so exposure factor will be 40% so it represents the percentage of loss a realized threat could have on certain asset percentage of loss if i may, if i say 100% of my warehouse will be damaged 1 lakh 50000 into 100 so the total loss will be 1 lakh 50000 that is your single loss expectancy so up to now it's clear 
Okay. Then next, single loss expectancy is not the right answer. After that, you need to calculate the annual loss. So annual loss expectancy is is a value that represents the estimated frequency of a strike taking place within a 12 month time frame. So single loss was a single miss. It was a it was a time to a single event. Okay. So sometimes the fire were to break with a, a earthquake or so. So that was a single event. So in ALE, you are trying to calculate the rate of occurrence in a year. So what are the chances that fire can break out in a year? If I if you say two in a year, three in a year, four in a year, once in a year, once in ten years, so that is annualized rate of occurrence. So this ranges from from never to one point zero once in a year to greater than one that is between a several times in a year. So if you say let's continue with my previous example, if I say fire taking place within a company data warehouse facility can cost thirty seven thousand five hundred in a tax. And the frequency that is ARO is once in ten years. So in that case, yearly will be three thousand seven hundred fifty, means that is thirty seven thousand five hundred into point one. If it is once in a year, if it is a once in a year, so that will be thirty seven thousand five hundred in a one. If it is in, if it is once in five year, means once in ten year, if once in hundred year, that will be thirty seven thousand five hundred into point zero one. So this is how it is calculated. So does that make sense, everyone? Panka, Gopal, now it's clear, dear. No clear. Okay, Mohammed, what you want me to explain? I will explain to you. Okay, Mohammed, let me know. I have unmuted you. What you didn't understand, I will explain to you. Basically, see, the, the I I have understood what SLE means and the annual loss expectancy that we ha having. Okay, basically the asset value um, I can understand. Uh, in, in the previous case, the exposure factor multiplied by the asset value, and we go, we've got the answer for the uh, the single loss expectancy. But in this case, okay. we are uh, calculating the loss that is occurring over the year, over the year, yeah. Yes. So what are the okay. chances? Look, that was the event. That was the event that could occur. Single loss expectancy. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. are the chances that that event can occur in a year? Because you know what is risk. Risk is the probability of impact and uh, and the rate of occurrence. So, what are the mm -hmm. chances that it occurs in a year? So, if it mm -hmm. is once in ten years, if once mm -hmm. in a year, so that on the basis of that, you know, you calculate the annual loss expectancy. Okay, okay. So, so basically, it it depends on the probability of the event occurring in a particular year. Yes, in a year. Okay. So, in a year, okay. if it is if it is once in ten year and all that, so that is how it is calculated. So, that is okay. Sense? Fine. Okay, so the problem with this is that means you know there are two kinds of approaches as I told you, qualitative and quantitative. So this is the one of a quantitative approach. The problem with okay. this is that approach is the, you how can you calculate that it can be means how can you look for earthquake? I can say that yes, if you know based on the calculation and not be based on the previous data, you can say that it can occur tenth in a you mean once in ten year or once in a five year or just like in India in North India once it. It's quite anticipated, and any time it can happen. So, but but on the basis of fire and all those things, it will be very difficult for you to predict and get all these things. Sure. So that's why yeah. you know, yeah, it, it's an advantage, disadvantage of the quantitative approach, risk analysis. Mm -hmm. That's why people. <coughs> yes, very true. So, main thing is that so that's why the disadvantage of this is very difficult to calculate the accurate value because you know how can you safely show that. If a fire were to occur and only 25 percent more of the data house will be or, or, or will be damaged, so mm -hmm. that sometimes it's very it, you need to have a tools available which should have a very fine calculations of a data and you should be having a very good historical data. But main thing is that on the basis of historical data you cannot calculate the uh, uh, just like in this case is fire and all you cannot calculate that thing. It can happen any time. Sure. So, okay, so it's clear, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. It's clear now. Th okay. Thanks, Ajit. Okay. Okay, so the problem with this approach is means the outcome you can have monetary value assigned to assets, comprehensive list of all possible and significant threats, probability of occurrence, rate of each threat, and loss potential the company can endure. But disadvantage calculations can be complex. Can management understand how these values were derived? Without automated tools, this process is extremely laborious. Okay, so standards are not available. Each person has its own way of interpreting the process and the results. Another one is a qualitative one. Okay, since 
you don't assign numbers and monetary values to components in the office. Instead, qualitative matters walk through different scenarios of risk and possibilities and rank the fairness of threats and validity. So in this, you know, you gather in a room, okay, you go through the best practices, you go through the brainstorming session, Delphi method, surveys and all to find out the things. The best example of qualitative risk analysis matrix is you can see it over here, likelihood and consequences. So these are likelihood they have defined almost certain, likely, possible, unlikely, rare. Then these are the insignificant, what are the consequences? I will be showing you my data with my risk assessment register, so that will be more clear to you, making it more clear to you. So that is one of part of a qualitative risk assessment. So now coming back to the slide. Okay. So here, calculating risk, the formulas are, you can see, SLE is equal to asset value into exposure factor. So you know, it's pretty simple. Miss in my time, and I have not seen any questions related to FISA, in questions related to this in MIS calculation, the examination, but as it is, uh, it's in the slide, so it's pretty simple calculation. So I think you should be uh, doing this, means you can understand this concept and do some portions related to that. I will give you, I will make you solve some portions related to SLEs and ALEs, okay, tomorrow. So risk is equal to probability of risk into cost of eventuality, then ALE is equal to SLE into ARO. So this is basically a part of a quantitative risk analysis. Okay, another approach is a risk-based audit approach. So risk-based audit approach is based on a concept in which determination of areas that should be audited is based on the perceived level of a risk. As I've given you examples that there are 10 processes, not possible for you to audit everything. So in that case, you need to define which areas need to be audited. So what you do, you do the risk assessment and which one is having the risk, then those, of course, those areas will be audited. Then residual risk. So this is one concept which we need to understand that. Rational risk is what? Rational risk basically what happens is risk you know it cannot be eliminated completely. You cannot eliminate risk completely. Even after applying all the levels of control, some risk will be left. And we call those risks are rational risk. So rational risk basically you are not the one who can take the decision on the matter rational risk. Okay. Rational risk can only be defined by can only be decided by management. Okay, management. Okay, you cannot take the decision on the rational risk, and it is totally dependent on the risk appetite of an organization or a risk appetite of a management. Risk appetite is how much risk a management can accept or is okay to deal with. So that is, you know, rational risk. Always remember, this represents management risk appetite. Normally, a control would be implemented to mitigate the risk to an acceptable level, but main thing is that risk cannot be mitigated fully. So even after applying a lot of controls to it, some minute risk will be less. Okay, so that risk is not residual risk, and you cannot take the decision on that, on, on that level of residual risk. It needs to be taken by the top level manager. Okay? Then audit risk. Audit risk is a risk that a report or information might contain an error that is immaterial, or a person or an auditor might be undetected, or auditor may not be able to find out something or it remain undetected during the audit period. Then risk assessment and treatment. What is risk assessment? It is a process of identifying, prioritizing, and quantifying risk against criteria for risk tolerant and objective relevant in the organization. Risk assessment, always remember one thing, it should be carried out regularly. It should not be a one-time process. Just like in my organization, in my organization, we are carrying, we are having a risk management forum and we are meeting regularly, means after one and a half months, to, to discuss about the risk for any ongoing risk. Because, you know, we are working in a quite volatile environment. So it's not possible to risk are changing, environment is changing quite frequently. So that's why it's a, it's a continuous activity. Even audit also a continuous activity. So audit is not like that. You do the audit and forget it. Control risk cannot be there. Control risk is the risk which is by the management. So control risk cannot be there. Detection risk and inherent risk will be there. Okay. Then there are different methods of treatment. Okay, those methods of treatment are risk mitigation. This is the best way and this is a normal way of treating with the risk. Applying adequate levels of control to lower the risk. This is the standard method people use that. Then risk acceptance. Maybe we found it out and not knowingly taking any action. So let's take an example. So that, you know, risk acceptance can only be taken by, decision of risk sector can only be taken by management and you need to do a proper cost benefit analysis of that. Let's take an example. This happens with us. You know, we work in a follow the sun environment. Follow the sun means, means in the morning we are active, 
in the in the in the evening hours in india means uk team means my uk counterparts are active and in my us team is active so you know in in the weekend we provide the call out support so for on, only on priority one incident priority two incident so in weekends you know uh, in our team means uk team doesn't have sufficient resources so they were not providing call out resources so the level second level of escalation is not next level of escalation is not available on weekends in the uk support so what we did means we we do the risk assessment and everything and it says okay so so the so cost of hiring that person is more than the level of risk so what we did is we have come to, we have live, highlighted the same to the management the management says okay you if something the probability of coming any p1 or p2 in that time is it's less moreover if something comes up okay so second line team is the team which as the team which is below us they can engage the vendor directly so they have accepted the we have highlighted all those things we have accepted the risk and find out to give the higher people the cost of hiring those people is more than the risk so that is okay fine i am accepting the risk okay and i am accepting the risk and let it be so only the management means you know i highlighted this to the management and management only takes that decision that risk avoidance risk avoidance means take example best example is suppose you have you know that your 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 you have implemented you have allowed the remote access the uh, you have allowed your uh, employee to access the company resources through remote access vpn <coughs> okay so that you know that uh, because of that you know some risk are there like the virus may get with some some you know the uh, infected system may get into infected system may get infect the whole network so what you do you simply decided to simply scrap that facility okay i am not giving any remote access vpn facility to my employee so you are simply avoiding that thing suppose if you are into retail business and you want to go into online so one you one what you do you do the risk assessment of going online to so find out there are many risks associated with it so simply say okay fine i don't want to take the risk let's avoid this thing that is risk you are simply avoiding that thing the other one is risk transfer or sharing so sharing the risk with the third party such as suppliers or insurance company like outsourcing the concept just like the outsourcing is one of the best way where, or or insurance companies is is a way of risk transfer sharing so is this clear friend risk assessment method of already explained to you there are two methods one is scoring system method and another one is judgmental method when you talk about scoring system method is sle ale and all that's a scoring system method another one is the judgmental method that i've explained to you in that case you know you don't need to apply the quantify value you don't need to quantify the things with the help of judgments and all you can do the well okay so let's take up business okay let's cover this one also okay so business process very simple topic so as an auditor you need to risk acceptance is a risk ratio yes means yeah you can say that you are accepting that rational risk is basically rational risk is you say the risk that is left even after applying the control and an acceptance is means you are accepting that risk okay fine i'm accept i'm okay with this risk okay so that can only be done with the help of doing the proper cost benefit analysis so as an auditor you need to be aware of different fundamental business processes like you know uh, just like they have given one example of transaction just like you have a bank in this you will be having a mobile banking gate in transaction then you have a chain store which have a point of sale transaction with credit card information electronic data interchange okay give me a minute what you say okay what uh, jaya give me a minute i am unmuting you what you want in okay jaya go ahead with jaya what you want in uh, uh, in from the previous slide the treatment is also there how to add it okay i didn't uh, your voice is not clear so what about the risk treatment how we take this uh, how we accept this risk and look Okay, risk treatment. As I told you, there are different methods of risk treatment. Mm -hmm. Like you can see, these are all methods of risk treatment. Means avoidance, mitigation. You can see it over here. These are risk treatment. Look, risk assessment is different. Look, as far as risk assessment and treatment, do you think I am fast? Okay, listen, listen. I will try to slow it down. Okay, so risk treatment basically there are four methods. Okay, fine, fine, wait. i will explain to you so risk treatment basically there are four risk assessment of already explained to you risk assessment is a way by which you identify prioritize and quantify risk against the criteria for risk always 
there, there are two methods of risk assessment quantifying quantify and qualitative okay so that is you know this then you come around risk treatment risk treatment under this you have different methods available means you are treating the risk so under this you will be having risk mitigation that is the best way of doing it means you are applying the adequate control to lower the risk so just like you find out one risk related to that there is no bcp dr available so then you can have the bcp dr plan in place okay to mitigate that risk second one is risk acceptance okay risk acceptance it means you know that means you find just like i have given you the example of my team okay so we don't have you know the support available in ukr in the weekend so my management we have highlighted this to our top level management okay top level management and and we did the cost benefit analysis of that when we did the cost benefit analysis of that we find out that if if, if we had the new so the control basically the control that we are taking the control that we are hiring is much more is much more costly than the than the cost of a risk so we if we you know we accept that way so that is you know risk acceptance then comes across risk avoidance risk avoidance says means ensure evading risk by ensuring actions that cause the risk of prevention i've given you two examples one is suppose you have implemented the remote access vpn for employee okay employee so what you find out that when you did the risk assessment of that means you planning for the that to open the remote access vpn for employee when you are doing the risk assessment of that you find it out that when you are defined <clears throat> okay so when you find out that this is the thing the, uh, when you find out that this is this this can this risk can occur and this thing can do that sorry what are the okay bear so when you are opening a remote access vpn okay so you find out that this can happen and this can uh, infect my network with the system there are many other risks associated with it what you do you simply try so so you say okay find there are many risks associated with that okay or i am getting problem so i am simply this card that thing i simply said okay i'm not providing a remote access vpn for my employees they need to come to the office for the work so that is your risk avoidance another thing is another example that i have given it to you you trying to go online and you do the risk assessment of that and you find it out that there are many many risks associated with that so that you simply avoid that so that is your risk avoidance another so this all comes under risk treatment okay risk assessment is different risk assessment and this all comes under risk treatment then you have a risk transfer sharing in this sharing with risk with third parties so the example the of this of the two best example of risk transfer sharing is outsourcing or an insurance company means you suppliers you find it out okay i don't have a resources and i have a risk in taking i mean i am finding it i am finding it difficult to take this and there is a risk associated with it so i find that there are two vendor they there is a vendor who can do better means that there is a vendor who who has expertise in this better than me what i can do i can transfer i can ask them i give them contracts and to do the work for me another one is the insurance company just like there is the earthquake or there is any other risk what to do you can give the you can buy the insurance from the insurance company so does it make sense everyone look this mitigation is means you are applying control give me a minute <coughs> okay so okay so there are different ways of handling the risk so you can see the risk case so let's take an example you can see it over here so many types of insurance so one is regarding the transfer of risk so if a company decides the total risk is too high to gamble with it can purchase insurance which should transfer the risk to an insurance company so that is your risk case If a company decides to terminate the activity, that is introducing the risk. This is known as risk avoidance. So just like I have given you example, take example that given. If a company allows employees to use instant messaging, there are many risks surrounding the technology because when you are using the instant messaging, so you know file to file transfer, peer to peering is there. So virus can uh, uh, virus can can enter your system. Along with that, uh, you can end up sharing very critical data. So the company could decide not to allow any IAM activity by the users because there is not a strong enough business need for its continued use. So that is your risk of all. Okay. Another one is risk mitigation. Okay. Where the risk is reduced to a level considered enough, considered acceptable enough to continue conducting business. So where where the risk is reduced to a level considered acceptable enough to continue conducting business. So this is labeled the implementation of firewall. 
training, intrusion detection, or some other type of control represents the type of risk mitigation. Another one is last one is accept the risk, in which the company understands the level of risk it is faced with as well as the potential cost of damage, damage and decide to just live with it and not implement the countermeasure. Now, many companies will accept risk with the cost benefit ratio indicates that the cost of countermeasure outweighs the potential loss value. So that is you know acceptance of a risk. So is it clear to you now everyone? Gopi? Okay. Fine. So next topic is clear. Okay, so next topic is about look, please understand there are topics in which I need to do this because a lot of things have to be covered. So where it requires timing, I am giving time to it, where it requires passing out, I will do it quickly. So I know where to give more important terms and where to pass it quickly. So, okay, fine. I'm acceptable for the fees. The last topic is very pretty easy. Okay. It's about fundamental business process. Okay, so as a manager, as an auditor, you need to be aware of, I think someone is not on the view. Okay, that's in this one. So there are different business processes and a manager needs to be aware of different payroll processes, account payable process and all as far as they are very important for the audit process. So give me a minute. So just like they, they have given the example of two business processes, like you have a process in which banking, you have a mobile banking, ATM transaction, then they have another example they have given about the point of sale transaction with credit card information and means an auditor means you need to be aware of all those things. And you know it's not only these things, you will not understand these things in a day. It comes with experience and with meeting. Okay. Then comes your judgment. Let's take a dinner break of 15 minutes. Okay. Then after that, we will do some portion related to, we will do this, we will be doing some portion related to the risk assessment and then we will conclude for the day. Okay. So, so please let me know if, if everything, everyone till now, whatever we have covered, is it understandable to you all? Did you understand the thing, whatever we have covered? You know, some of you are reading these things or getting these things for the first time. So give yourself some time. Okay, when you read it from the book, read along with me, read along with me. When when you do when you read it just like this is the first domain I think one point five domain I will be covering within tomorrow and today. Okay, so read this one point two five one the topics that I have covered in the next week and then only you will be able to, you know do it well in the second exam. Okay, so friends, let's conclude for the day today. We have done risk assessment in great detail. Okay, so remaining part means I will start tomorrow. 